is a huge honor for me to be podcast interviewing Dr. Andrea Shepperson. Did I say that right? Andrea. Andrea, Andrea Shepperson. <laughs> I'm sorry. Very Andrea Shepperson, which means uh, you married a man who was a British sheep herder. Is that correct? Effectively, how it is. Effectively, that so. So um, th this I'm so excited about this podcast. Dr. Andrea Shepperson is one of New Zealand's best-known dental speakers. She has helped dentists and hygienists globally in the quest for clear, practical solutions to everyday problems. She's a wet finger dentist herself. She understands the hearts and minds of dentists and their problems. Dr. Shepperson is an innovator, disruptor, teacher, futurist, and leader. What sets her apart from the field of speakers is her ability to craft stories that showcase great clinical examples with practical solutions for everyday problems. She is relevant, engaging, and inspiring, finding new ways to look at dentistry differently and giving dentists clinical confidence and logical pathways to try new things. She's fascinated by new. She is at the forefront of dental knowledge. She has the ability to trigger light bulb moments in her presentation. Dr. Shepperson's motivation comes from a desire to provide Novell Solutions that Project Life-Changing Outcomes for Dentists and Patients. She's the founder of The Dental Fingerprint, and her commitment to the long view has placed her as an innovator and authentic provider of care for patients from many walks of life, those patients who value longevity, wellness, and a true understanding of their needs, seek her services, and those dentists who value empathy, authenticity, and courage, prize her views. It's such an honor that you uh, came on my show today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Howard, for having me. So now it's already tomorrow over there. That's why, so that's why you're a futurist because you live in tomorrow. So uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're yeah. cheating. You're already a day ahead. Of uh, <laughs> so most of most of the listeners show it's about eighty three percent is the United States and Canada, and then the other seventeen percent is like one hundred and forty five countries. Um, so um, you, what, what did you want to talk about today? You, you talk about so many different things. Uh, originally, you were talking about the you want to talk about the future of dentistry and corporate dentistry. What, what would you like to talk about today? Um, either of those subjects. I mean, I think corporate dentistry is part of the future and I'm part of corporate dentistry. So I sold my practice about eight years ago to um, New Zealand's largest corporate dental company. And I'm also a director of that company. So I now sit on the board of the company. And I guess I have a really intimate relationship with corporate dentistry and the direction that it's going in. And, what, and what's the name of that corporate? That's called Lumino the Dentists. Spell, spell that. L-U-M-I-N-O. Lumino. Lumino the dentists. Is that from so that, illumination? Uh, I guess so. Illumination, illuminating the smile. I wasn't involved in the inception of the name. You know, it's, it, that was done some years ago in the branding. But, you know, the company has just uh, purchased their 100th practice in New Zealand. And, uh, you know, it's pretty, a pretty significant market share. And they also own um, the parent company, Abano Healthcare, owns Maven Dental Group in Australia as well, uh, which is, is sitting not far off 100 practices in Australia. And obviously that's a much bigger market with potential um, for huge expansion. And where's Banner out of? Is that uh, what where's you said that's the parent company? What country are they out of? Abano. Abano Healthcare is, in, is a New Zealand healthcare company listed on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. And what is that uh, um, WWW? How do you spell uh, that? That'll be Abano Healthcare. Uh, are you Abano saying Obano? Healthcare. Spell it. Spell it. Uh, Abano, A B A N O, healthcare.co.nz or NZ for the Americans. So, a um, a hundred off it. Now, New Zealand's what? I mean, four million people? Or? Four million, about four and a half million people at the moment. And how many dentists would there be? Would you guess? Uh, there's around about, I think there's around about 2,800, maybe three, well, maybe up to 3,000. I, I, off the top of my head, I'm not entirely sure. And you got but 100 off. So, so let's say there were 3,000 and there was 100. So one out of 30 would be 0.3%. So that that's... I think we hold at the moment about uh, 12 to 14% market share. Of all the companies combined in New Zealand? Yes. Yes. 12 to 14 percent. That is amazing. What, what do you, what do you think's driving that and why are you a fan of it? I guess, um, I guess dentists are looking at the future and they're going, you know, we, we're facing a lot of things. We, and recently I, I just gave a presentation at a big dental expo on the weekend in New Zealand. 
And uh, we, I was talking specifically about dentistry's tipping point, uh, you know, the LinkedIn article that you had read, and I expanded on that. And, it, it, you know, some of it is around technology, some of it's around the investment in technology, and trying to do that as a solo practice is really hard. So I think that we're seeing um, younger dentists coming out with lots of debt. When I went to dental school in New Zealand, education was free. You know, you look at, certainly in the United States, it, it costs a lot of money to go to dental school. It does here too now, but not on the scale of the U.S. education system. Uh, and I, I've been looking intimately at the U.S. education system because my daughter got accepted at Caltech um, to study chemistry. And, uh, and we looked at the price of the US education and just went, no, this is, this is, this is out of our league. So actually, she got accepted at Oxford. So she's going to Oxford now. Those were, bad, like, those were both bad ideas. You know why? Why? You know why? Because uh, I have uh, probably about a half dozen patients over the last 30 years whose yeah. daughter, they're all happy because their daughter um, got some uh, accepted to some university in Europe somewhere some fancy yeah. smancy university, then went over there and fell in love with the man. And now they're two grandkids uh. or a 10 hour plane flight away. So rule number one, never send your daughter to another country <laughs> or you're going to live the rest of your life yeah. with grandchildren uh, yeah. 747 away. But um, so, see, I'm, I'm going to struggle with having her on the other side of the world. There will be there'll be tears at the airport without question. It's going to be really hard for me having her so far away. But anyway, that Just is tell her she's not allowed to date men. No, absolutely that's, that's not. That's the world. It has no, to come home. That's she the can rule. only we'll date an, an Aussie or a Kiwi. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, so I think, you know, the cost of education, young dentists are coming out. I think that there's a sector of, who are entrepreneurial and have got that hunger to try their own thing and go into their own practices. But a lot of them look at it and go, hey, it's just way too hard. If I can fall into a role... Uh, where I'm supported with great mentoring, I've got quality assurance built in, I've got investment in technology and, and you know, capital, possibly there's equity opportunities going forward, you know, in some of the examples in the US like PDS offer equity. So, uh, I, you know, I think that there are, you know, the financial rewards, the collegiality and the mentoring support um, is being built into corporate dentistry and in, in, in good in good corporates. You know, I, I think there are some that operate as just machines, production machines, but I think well-run corporates um, provide all of those additional things. Yeah, I, I think the worst thing about um, when people talk about corporate, you know, they, they talk about it like this one thing, whereas in America there's, I think there's 350 different corporate mm. dentistries. Um, and they're all from, you know, some of them are doing an amazing job and some of them are doing uh, a poor job. It's like I'm 100% Irish and I get uh, upset when people said all Irish are drunks when only 38% of us are, you know, that, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, My husband's actually a little bit Irish too. Is he, is he a are. drinker? Uh, he, no, he's not I, really a drinker. Actually. He's I, a, he's I'm not a, either. I just always tease. Um, I can't right. find Maven Dental on, on the internet. Do they got a WW? Uh -huh. Maven Dental's just rebranded. They uh, they were uh, called Dental Partners. Oh, Dental so, Partners. Okay. Yeah, if you look Dental Partners, you'll probably that. find them. Okay. So so let me let me ask you this: If someone was asking, okay, look at um, look at all the different corporate dentistries in Australia, New Zealand, United States. What would you say are the? How would you measure a corporate dentistry as good versus bad? One of the ways I measure the chains in America is um, some of them their average dentist doesn't even stay with them a calendar year. Yeah. So, so I'm sitting there thinking, well, if you can't even keep your dentist for a year, how, how are you going to keep your customers for life? If you can't even keep your dentist for a year, what, what metrics would you say? Uh, well, I, I, Howard, I think that's an, I think that's an awesome metric. You know, we, we for example, we go through an earnout phase. So we, you know, the acquisition process occurs over a period of time with a, a pay, a capital payment up front and then a, you know, a final 15% payment at the end of a, of a period. And and it's amazing how many of our, what we call lead dentists, so they would have been the original practitioners who sold the practice, are still with the company. We're sitting up around the 85% mark. So there's been attrition through retirement. There's been some people who decided to go overseas. You know, some people who, who but very few people who have actually left and then gone back into their own practices. So that I think that that's a great metric. What one of the things that I do see happening a little bit in Australia is that Australia's got a huge oversupply of dentists. So they built a lot of dental schools. They've got a lot of young dentists coming out, and after the global financial crisis, dentists were not retiring in the same way that they did. 
and older dentists were finding that they, you know, what they thought was an asset had actually become a liability because their practice wasn't able to be transitioned. And so they, you know, they were not retiring at the age that they thought they were going to. They were having to practice a bit longer. And so you had this this aging dental workforce that was still, you know, in the practice. And then this huge number of young dentists coming out who were struggling to find work. And so what, what happens sometimes, and I spoke at a conference last year in Australia where there were a lot of young dentists there, hungry for knowledge. And they they were in practices where they were the sole you know, the sole dentist or they were put into the lead dentist position with one or two years experience. Now, now that just doesn't work. That's a recipe for malpractice. It's a, it's a recipe for bad habits. It, I, you know, I just think it's, it's fraught with difficulties. So a good corporate, in my view, has a structure where young dentists are put into a mentored position, you know, so that there's a good, strong leader, that leaders are identified who have an ability to teach and mentor, um, and that there's a very strong sense of collegiality. And, you know, that's another lesson that I hear a lot of dentists I'm complaining about, you know, because hu all humans don't want any competition. I mean, you know, half of Americans don't want there to be any globalization or international trade. They want to ban imports. So, so all all humans hate competition. But I have to I have to remind these guys bashing corporate dentistry that a lot of the reason uh, corporate dentistry was so successful in America is because the corporate dentistry people went and got a hundred million dollar line of credit and were offering liquidity, especially to the big group practices that could never sell to some mm -hmm. kid twenty five years old walking out with three hundred fifty thousand dollars. In fact, the, the biggest, most successful one in America is Heartland, and they mm. routinely were buying offices that did two to five million, where the owner, Dennis, was saying, I sold it because if I didn't sell it to Rick Workman, I probably could have never sold this thing. I mean, so, yeah. so they, you eventually build a dental office that becomes an illiquid asset. It's kind of mm -hmm. like when you sell a home, you can sell a three-bedroom, two-bath all day long. But once you got eight bedrooms and a five-car garage, you pretty much own that home the rest of your life. Unless you can find some uh, soccer player millionaire to, to, to come buy it. So, so it's offering liquidity to the older dentist and it's offering jobs to the younger dentist. So, so yeah. you're saying it's uh, 12 to 14 percent in Australia. Um, what, what do you think? Uh, will, in Australia, I mean, I mean, in New I Zealand, I mean. Australia, the market share is a bit smaller at the moment just because of the sheer size of Australia. You know, it's a big country. So, you know, in New Zealand, we're sitting at around that figure. And what and what do you think um, it's going to uh, max at? I mean, what what what, what do you, what, do you, what do you think it'll be uh, in 10, 20, 30, 40 years? Uh, that's a good question. I I think that there will be uh, probably other larger corporates, you know, who enter the New Zealand space. Although we're, we're a small country, so I you know I think the viability of that in the medium term is is probably questionable. We've got small. We've got little small groups, you know, um, DSOs that are set up effectively. We, we don't actually have that structure, the DSO and the MSO that you have in, in the United States because, you know, anybody in New Zealand can actually own a dental practice. You've got you've got restrictions on that in the United States depending on which state you're in. So, but we do have, um, we do have entrepreneurial dentists who own uh, maybe six or eight practices. So we've got you know, the smaller group practice thing going on in our country and the extent to which those people expand, I don't know. You know, I, I, um, I really love Mark Cooper's um, work and I read his blogs all the time and he had a lovely one recently that talked about the fact that, you know, those smaller group practices, the guys who aspire to compete with, with the Heartlands and the PDSs ultimately have got, you know, have got that fire in their belly to compete. They um, they fail to recognise that they need a, a good management infrastructure with expertise in different areas, and unless they can actually put that into place, then they're not going to grow at the rate that they should because they're still trying to retain control of the whole thing. Um, and so, you know, recognising that that there is specialist expertise in, in that um, management structure, I think, is really important. That as a dentist, you can't do everything. So, um, where will we go with this? Well, I, I you know, I think we're still going to have. Um, we're still going to have uh, boutique practices. We're going to have niche practices. Absolutely. People have a point of difference. In the same way in the lab industry that we've seen global consolidation of the laboratory industry, you know, with large milling centres, 
Um, but we've still got, you know, ceramics who are, are boutique and have a particularly unique market and who have local relationships. So yeah, I still think there's a huge opportunity, even though good corporates should be encouraging, uh, you know, that, that local relationship within uh, a corporate practice that's in a particular geographical community. Hopefully the team in that practice has got that local relationship with their community. Um, I still think you're going to have pockets of, you know, smaller practices for sure. I don't uh, think it's going to be all corporate. My, uh, my son Gregory um, always tells me, he says, Dad, there's a, there's a million attorneys in the United States and they started getting into corporate dentistry long before, corporate law long before dentists ever thought of it. And they plowed out with 50% were in large corporate law firms mm. and the other 50% were all individuals. And that's his analogy for saying that that's what it'll be. But right now in the United States, there are now 35, what we call very large corporate dental chains. And um, they control, they have about 12 to 15% of the U.S. dental market employing over 8,000 dentists with over $6 billion in annual revenue. The 2015 U.S. dental market was $129 billion with um, 955,000 employees and 175,000 locations. But I, I want to ask you this question. What I kind of see, because I, I got my MBA from Arizona State University, and, and I, I get group because a dentist can't wear all those hats in marketing and HR and insurance and billing and operations. So the, the small offices are kind of inefficient. But when, when you build a, a management team, let, let's say it's just five, six, seven, eight people. And then you're running, you go into a market and you got a dental office in a north, south, east, west, and downtown. And you have that, that, that management team. Those offices are far more efficient and train and hum and float, no doubt about it. And I go into, you know, half of America lives in 117 towns. And I, I don't care if that big town is in North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas. They, they just, they're, they're just more efficient. What I don't see is then you take another layer, like a, like a, a capital, you know, like like the, the, the headquarters where they're going to take off another 14% off the top. I, I don't see what that headquarters, um, I, I don't see what uh, they're doing for their local dental office that justifies 14 cents on the dollar from all their efficiency. So I see, I see a flat level of one corporate. I see one layer. Where, you know, you want to build a management team and run, uh, I think Mark Cooper thinks the sweet spot is what, a dozen dental offices? What, what, what's he think the sweet spot is? Um, I don't know. You'd actually have to ask Mark that. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I, I had him on an earlier podcast. But I think, he, I think he and I both agree that it, it's about, you know, a dozen, maybe 8, 10, 15 offices and man, corporate is so efficiency. But it, it's hard to justify the second layer of management siphoning 14% off the top. The shareholder return. Yeah. 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 I, I you know, I think that you, we have a very lean management structure. I think everybody works super hard at head office. Uh, and so, you know, the company, I think, manages to keep their head office costs down substantially for that reason. So, um, but yes, there always is a return to the shareholder for sure. You know how many people work for me? About half. Okay. That's perfect. How that, that, that's, I, I'm about the same. I that's my horrible better. joke for the day. So, so, um, so, do, you know, you you've lectured around. You're aware of all these markets. Is um, is dentistry in New Zealand pretty much the same as Australia? Pretty much the same as the United States? How, um, how does how does it differ really down under? The main difference is that we're entirely fee for service, so we have no insurance. Uh, and so, that, you know, that makes it quite a flexible and interesting market, but on and then on some levels, a slightly more challenging market, depending on the way you look at it. So, you know, I think Australia has some, you know, health, health funds. And so patients get uh, access to a lot more reimbursement in, in Australia as they do in the United States and New Zealand. We don't have any of that at all. The only the only thing we have is Accident Compensation Corporation, or called ACC, which is our government funded uh, reimbursement for any accident related conditions. So if you if you have a tooth knocked out in a rugby match. Um, or a cricket ball hits you in the mouth, you know, smash your teeth, uh, then, you, you know, uh, you're going to have that funded so you can have an, an implant placed and the full surgical cost will be reimbursed uh, by ACC, assuming that you've got a largely intact and well-maintained mouth and, and the restorative cost will be covered to around about 75% of the fee. 
By the way, I want to tell you, I've lectured at an all-star. You remember Ruth Port from uh, Port Laboratories, Ruth and George Port? Absolutely. Before George passed. But anyway, about every five years, they'd have me come down to uh, Auckland. And I, 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 I've told everybody, I, I think that's the prettiest country on earth. And they, they film what, Lord of the Rings there? Oh, they film Lord of the Rings around New Zealand, yes. Yeah, but I mean, it, it's just crazy beautiful. I mean, it's just, I mean, there's just nothing like it. Mm. Um, no, it is a beautiful country. So I got to ask you, deep down in your heart, do you guys, then you call yourselves Kiwis. Why, why is that? Is, that? is that where the Kiwi was first found or discovered? Or uh, it's, a, it's our national symbol, so our little flightless bird. Oh, that's right. It's a flightless bird versus America. It's a little green fruit. <laughs> so the kiwi is a flightless bird. Kiwi is a flightless bird. So it comes out, it's nocturnal. It's got a long beak. It, it, it's kind of an innocuous little bird. I, you know, it's not particularly colorful or grand. Or We actually, we actually had uh, recently a referendum to see if we could change our flag. Uh, which is very similar to the Australian flag. The only only difference is the number of stars on it, and uh, and in fact there were some quite nice proposals. I voted for one of the new flags. My husband voted against. He liked the old flag and couldn't see the point of spending all this money on a referendum. So we didn't change our flag. Um, so so they were, you know we wanted to bring in some of the other symbols like the silver fern and you know other things that would look great on a on an Olympic podium or on a you know on a sports field on the top of an America's Cup boat or something like that. So, uh, so yeah, the kiwi is a flightless bird, and uh, that's that's our national symbol, and so that's where that term comes from. Do you have the kiwi fruit? Do you call that little green fruit? We do. We have the kiwi fruit. Okay. Wow. I thought it was the kiwi fruit, uh, not not the bird. I, I, I missed that all three times I went down there then. <laughs> well, funnily enough, the body of it, you know, the actual fruit itself looks like the body of the bird in some way. So right. It's, you know, kind of feathery and brown and, you know, it sort of looks a little bit like a kiwi bird. So let me, let me ask you this question. So you're a woman, Dennis. Um, so some, um, some people are saying that, um, you know, when dentistry in America has gone from an almost entirely male profession to now half the graduates are women. Some are saying that is one of the multifactorial reasons that's fueling corporate America because um, a lot of data shows that about 65% of the dentists in corporate, so two-thirds are female dentists and a third are male, and that um, when I talk to dental students, I'm in a dozen dental schools a year, um, you know, you hear about half the women dentists say, you know what, I want an eight-to-five job because I want to get married, I want to have kids, I want to be a soccer mom. I, I don't want to, at the end of the day, stay there and do SEO and marketing and payroll and buy supplies and all that uh, stuff. Do you think changing from a mostly male to now a half female is, is one of the multifactorial reasons why corporate dentistry is exploding? I think that may be a factor. I think there's no question that when you look at some of the stats with women dentists that they are more inclined to work part-time they're more inclined to take out time to have families, whereas a male dentist, a young male dentist might be married, have a family, but he'll continue working and the wife will be the one who, who works part time. We have quite a lot of husband wife dentist couples, you know, so they're both dentists and the wife will be the one that tends to, to opt to do part time work or take maternity leave. So there's no doubt that the husband is still regarded, you know, principally as the breadwinner. I, but at the same time, I'm also seeing um, young male dentists who who are not inclined to want to run a business. I mean, it takes a certain amount of tenacity and a hell of a lot of hard work. I mean, I've done this for years. I did three. Now, I want you to explain what you mean. Uh, what you mean by hard work? Because a lot of millennials are listening to this and they uh, they don't know what what you mean by the well, word hard, hard work or work. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll generate so much hate mail on this podcast so I can, I can see the emails coming. I'm joking. <laughs> well, you know, living, breathing. Uh, but, but, breathing but, but, that's, but that's a true fact of what you're seeing. And you can measure millennials thinking um, um, with uh, our Generation X with their birth rate. So you go to countries with Japan with the lowest baby rate of, um, you know, you need 2.3 babies per, per female just to maintain the population. Japan's the, I believe, the only country that's under one. It's 0.9. And when they go in there and ask these women, why are you not having kids? She, she, they're just like, why? I mean, my, my, my dad worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and then dropped dead of a heart attack. And, and you bring in a kid, and it's all this stress in the first grade, trying to get in the best middle schools and the best high schools and the best colleges. 
And then they go work their brains out at a uh, Honda or a Toyota their whole career. And they're just saying, I don't even want, I don't even want to bring a kid into that world. That that's so, so the millennials are looking, you know, my, my four boys, their number one comment to me is always like, dad, why do you work so hard? Slow the hell down. I mean, you know, it's just seeing patients, you know, flying around, you know, so, so I believe that I could see a lot of millennial men and women going into corporate just because they're very open that they do not want to work as hard as their old man did. Yeah, I, I think there's probably truth in that, Howard, absolutely. And I had an interesting conversation with a, a millennial hygienist um, not so long ago, and she said to me, you know, how old, do we, uh, how old were your children when you went back to work? And I said they were six weeks old and my husband stepped in to care for them um, until we got a nanny, you know, when they were little. And she said, why, why did you go back to work when they were six weeks old? That's incredible. And I said, well, because somebody had to pay the staff's wages. Somebody had to pay the rent. Some, you know, the locum never ever generates the revenue that you would like. That's the reality of owning a practice. And, uh, and her comment was, well, gee, I think, I think our generation – will get the work-life balance right. And I said, yes, you might, but you probably won't own a house. You know, so, and and we're seeing that. We, um, New Zealand at the moment is facing, particularly in Auckland, we're facing a huge housing crisis, you know, where, where the relationship between the cost of purchasing a house and salaries is just enormous. You know, the multiple is, is getting up to eight or nine. So Eight or um, nine what? The house is eight or nine times order. annual Sorry. wages? The house, you said the multiple eight or nine, meaning that, the house costs yeah, eight or nine yeah, times the bank, average and the wage. The sector says you can only borrow a certain um, multiple of your income, you know, because you can't. It's going to put too much strain on your on your income to help service a mortgage, and it places you know the banking sector at huge risk. And so our Reserve Bank at the moment is taking a close look at whether they they impose that multiple, which operates in countries like the UK, for example, because we've got one of the most unaffordable housing cities in the world currently. So Auckland is just you know, had a huge influx of, of uh, so how, investment. So how come that doesn't economically cause a housing boom where they just start building so many houses? Why, why is that equilibrium not there, do you think? Uh, because at the moment, land and uh, land and um, intensification is not allowable. And uh, so there's not a lot of land, first of all. And, and then the process of getting consents to build and certainly to build up and building greater density is being resisted. So currently our, our local council is about to release in August some, some outcomes uh, with a new unitary plan, which will then allow further intensification. But, you know, the impact of that is you've got the whole the whole NIMBY thing going on, not, you know, not in my backyard, um, because people who've currently had expansive leafy suburbs with big lots, you know, saying, no, we don't want to have terrace housing here. So. So it, 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 there's this tension going on as a place becomes more desirable and a lot of people want to come live here. And, you know, I, I think at the moment people are looking at Europe and going, mm, it's kind of tense in Europe, you know. Uh, Europe's got some issues, the UK's got some issues. And so we, we've got a lot of immigrants coming from all over the world, actually, to, well, to want to... Well, if yeah. we elect Trump, you'll get even more immigrants. <laughs> yeah, no. You, you might I know, get... we're getting Americans coming already. I think if Trump wins, Canada will build a wall. <laughs> so um so can how hard is it the fluidity of uh markets and licensing between australia and new zealand how hard is it for uh, an australian to practice in new zealand or vice versa it's easy we have we have a trans tasman so the tasman sea connect you know is the sea between us um and there's a trans tasman reciprocity so i could i could go to australia and get licensed to practice there easily Nice. That, that, that's very nice. So, um, so, um, U S dental income peaked in 2005 at 219,000 a year. It's been sliding down uh, about 4,500 a year by 2015. It was down to 174. So they lost $45,000 a year, mainly from switching to fee for service to PPO. So instead of me charging 1200 mm -hmm. for a crown, they sign up for a plan that says, we'll only pay you 800 for a, a crown. And, and that lower fee uh, didn't come off the rent, mortgage, equipment, build-out, computer, insurance, malpractice, yeah. professional dues that came out of the profit margin. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? And do you see that happening in Australia or New Zealand? Or is that an American deal? Or what, what are your no, thoughts on that? 
No, it's it's starting to happen a little bit here, but I guess because we don't have a lot of insurance, you know, it's not impacting us to quite the same degree. We don't have a, a health fund, so there's not really a capitation system. We do provide uh, free care for children under the age of 18 in New Zealand through what you would call a mid-level provider. So, so there is a capitation system that goes on in that scheme. I'm not part of that scheme. I'm entirely a restorative, you know, high-end restorative practice that's fee-for-service. But yeah, so I'm not, I'm not big on that. I really am. Not, I've never been a fan of that concept. Uh, of, of a dental plan or, you know, a capitation system. And to me, it's, it's a limitation to best practice. But, but I think the reality is it's there and you've got to find ways of adding efficiency. One of the things I talked about this weekend was the way we, the way we look at our dental assistants' roles and the, and the role that technology is going to increasingly play. So I was playing, for example, with a CareStream scanner in my office recently, Chairside Oral Scanner. And you know, the ability to scan and, uh, you know, and then send um, data very quickly to my ceramist to fill out an online form and, you know, and then I can email some photographs and other supporting material was phenomenal. And I think that we're going to see dental assistants become increasingly digital. So if you haven't got, if you haven't got some digital skills in the workforce going forward, I think you're really going to struggle in dentistry because digital is going to streamline the process and perhaps add time efficiencies um, to what we do. So, so I, I, you know, I think that we're going to have to shift our thinking in terms of the way we structure our day and how we use our teams and what's, what their scope of practice will be. So in New Zealand, their, their scope is somewhat limited and we don't kind of have a career pathway. You at least have expanded functions, dental assistants. We don't have that capacity in New Zealand. So, I, I, And I raised that in my presentation this weekend, that the Dental Council and the Dental Association needs to look at you know, what those jobs are going to look like going forward and what skill sets do we need to become digital assistants. You still have to suck, spit, and protect the airway, absolutely. You know, but I, but I just think data management um, is going to become a new skill. Data management? Yeah. And what, what, what do you mean by it's going to be a new skill? Well, I think that I, I still think there's plenty of people coming into the workplace that don't have the ability to, to uh, manipulate images, you know, even, even just to, to upload and send and collate and, you know, I'm a digital smile design instructor. So, so, you, so when example. you're talking about the future of dentistry, you're, you're, you're saying you, you're seeing it all going digital. Absolutely. And, and do you think, I, and so, so we both just watched uh, Dent Supply, the biggest American dental company, Mary Serona, the largest yeah. German, or largest really European dental company. What, what did you think of that merger and acquisition? Why, why do you think they got married? Well, I think they got married just to capture a bigger share of that digital space, you know, and, I, and in the same way that we're seeing conglomeration in the lab industry, we're also seeing it in the in the dental industry, supply industry sector too. I mean, they bought Astrotech as well previous year. So, um, you know, there's been big expenditure, $5.5 billion to buy Serona. And, uh, you know, so I, I just think that that's about market share. It's about having a, a digital a digital um, capacity, you know, we saw Ivoclar by Veland, and that's all about moving into the milling space. And when, when did they buy Veland? Oh, I think that was about three years ago, from memory, off the top of my head. And that was Maybe a CAD milling? Yes. Yep, German milling company. So, and I, you know, and, and that would have been a, a, a deliberate tactic to be able to embrace um, milling the milling technology and be able to use products like Emacs, for example, you know, in a in a, an industrial. I, I, my my I, I shouldn't say this on a podcast, but I, I think Ivo Claro is right now probably the hottest person in play for a merger and acquisition because it's privately held, and you got Monster Three MSB, Monster Densefly, Serona. You know, you got these mega companies. There's this little family business right in the middle of Liechtenstein. Doing a billion a year, you know that's going to get gobbled up someday. Yeah, I'm an OL for um, KOL for I'm class, so I I feel like I'm part of the family, and uh, you know it really is a great company. Well, Bob um, Ganley is probably the smartest, classiest guy in dentistry, mm, isn't he? Though, absolutely. I mean, he is just uh, he's just uh, adorable. I mean, I just just love that guy. he's always right. He's always smart. He's always so. Uh, He's he's just an amazing man. I, I want to ask you another question that confused me. Um, you know, when you live in your own tribe, 
you, you know, the, the, what, people's dearest thoughts they hold to them, like their, uh, their religion, their language, their culture. It's just random luck where you're born. I mean, my oldest sister's uh, a, a cloistered Catholic nun. And I always tell her, do you realize if you'd have been born in Mecca, you'd be a Muslim? You know, you'd be Islamic. Um, if you were born in New uh, India, you'd be Hindu. If you're, you know what I mean. And when I go around the world, I mean, like Singapore, no dental insurance, fluoridated water. You go to Tokyo, no fluoridated water, dental insurance. Um, you go to America, it's gone from indemnity insurance. When I got to school, ninety five percent took indemnity. Now eighty two percent take a PPO. And when I got to school in England, about nineteen thousand out of their nineteen thousand, almost all of them were NHS. Mm-hmm. And now, thirty years later, five six thousand of them finally said, "You know." So, so it, it's so hard to understand because whenever you're talking to a Chinese dentist, where they have the same number of dentists in the United States, we both have one hundred and fifty thousand full time practicing general dentists. You know, they, they they don't even get it. They're like, "Well, well, if you drink Coca Cola and you don't brush and floss your teeth, why would your boss, let alone Obama?" pay for your root canal. I mean, does he, they don't pay for your car. They don't pay for your house. They don't pay for your motorcycle, your golf game, your vacation to Disneyland. Um, it's just so hard. So, so my example is this asking the Americans to get off PPOs. I would have the only example I can point around the world is the English, uh, the United Kingdom, NHS. What, what, what are your thoughts of the, uh, NHS? I mean, we're, we're the same age. What what are your thoughts of the NHS dentistry over our careers? I mean, haven't you don't you agree that the general dentists and 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 the United Kingdom are walking away from the NHS in groves? In oh yes, group? I think they are. And I, I I've had very limited experience of the NHS. I do, I am actually uh, I was licensed to practice in the in the UK some years ago, and I renewed my license um, a few years ago, and then dropped it again because I wasn't really spending any time there. But the um, I worked on the NHS very briefly back in 1987 when I had a year off and travelled and UK was a stopover on my OE, we call it, our overseas experience. So when you have an education for free, you can then work for a couple of years, put a backpack on your back and travel the world for a year. So, you know, that, that's good work-life balance, I think. Um, I don't know that the millennials are quite doing that these days. But the... Um, So, you know, my experience was high traffic, you know, high volume, work fast, um, very difficult to implement the standard of care that you would get in a fee-for-service kind of environment. And so I think, you know, there have been big constraints, you know, on NHS spending and and I'm not intimately involved, so it's probably really hard hard for me to comment on it. I'm commenting very much as an outsider remote. But I, I think that would be the drive for dentists in the UK to switch to private I think, unfortunately, there was probably a transitionary period where some people switched to private and were still doing dentistry the NHS way, which wasn't great. Uh, but, you know, we've got, we've got some stunning practitioners over there who are many who are good friends of mine who are running, you know, just top level practices in the UK and doing some beautiful work. So I, yeah, I think, you know, we, we, it's an interesting shift, isn't it, globally? And we, we because we haven't had the insurance thing really happening here in New Zealand, it's going to be quite fascinating when it actually, when it actually hits to see what that conversion rate is going to be and how it's actually going to impact us. Well, I, I, the thing I love the most about international travel is, you know, the humans are all the same. They all have the same needs and wants for, shelter, food, dentistry, whatever. But I just love how you get to see how every culture sold everything differently from dental insurance to even a toilet to the window pane. I just love how, you know, the same human, I just love the variety of all the solutions they came out with the same problems, but there's virtually no dental insurance in South America, Asia, or Africa. And, uh, and you just, you just find, like, like I say, like some of the most success, I, I'd say the, the average most successful dentist I've ever seen in the world were pretty much Singapore, and they, they don't have any dental insurance. But it's yeah. so cultural because in America, um, they just are born to believe that, you know, you buy your house, you buy your car, you're responsible for everything until it comes to your human body. Mm-hmm. And then and then your, your, your employer's, you know, responsible for that. Maybe that's why everybody smokes and drinks and is overweight in America because they don't have to worry about their body. <laughs> Although I do, I do hear that you, you're having a shift in some of your policies. So some of your policies will support you to go to the hygienist four times a year and 
be engaged in a preventative program, but when the time comes to have a crown, you won't quite get the um, the, the same level of support. So um, I do hear that in some sectors in the US um, that, that corporate-based insurance policies that are offered to employees are changing. My husband worked in, um, he's a he's a material scientist. I call him the Gordon Ramsay of the iron industry. So um, he, he, you know, Gordon Ramsay, the chef who goes in to solve restaurant problems, well, he goes into um, iron plants and solves problems. So that's his, his area of expertise. And he was he spent three years commuting and working in a small town in northern Minnesota. And, um, and so, you know, it was interesting um, to get feedback from him just about um, the whole health care, the health, health fund support of dentistry, for example, because the people he worked with are quite fascinated with the fact that his wife was a dentist and wanted to know how it worked in New Zealand. So, you know, they were on, they were on a, a policy that uh, supported them for preventative care but didn't give quite the level of cover for uh, restorative. Well, in Amer- America... Um... Eight percent of the dentists uh, participate in HMOs. Eighty-two percent PPOs. Six percent indemnity. Only five percent of dentists only do indemnity. Four percent do a discount plan, and one percent does a depot DEPO. But in as far as insurance, you know, forty percent of Americans don't have it. But basically, um, if you have fifty employees in your company, fifty percent of the employees will have dental insurance. So about half if, you're, if your company is 50 employees. And by the time you work for a company with 1,000 employees, 90% have it. So in America, if you work for a big Fortune 500 company, 9 out of 10 have dental insurance. If it's a mid-sized company of 50 employees, half would have it. But if you work for uh, you know, the average company, uh, doesn't even have five employees. So n- none of them pretty much have it. Mm. You know? Okay. So mm. that's... Uh, it's just uh, amazing. I, I, lo- I love I love the variety. I love going around the world. So let me ask you about this. Um, marketing is another vastly deal. Like, like um, one, one of the saddest letters I ever got is some dentist listened to my uh, um, 30-day dental MBA, which is on iTunes and YouTube, and started doing all this advertising, and they suspended his license. He didn't even know that everything I was saying was illegal in Hong Kong. Um, and, it's il- and it's illegal in some of the craziest countries. Like, uh, I mean, just for, like, no reason. Like, why, why would... Why would dental advertising be illegal in Romania or, you know, some, some of these? I mean, <laughs> where, where does this come from? So I want to ask you, what, what, what is the uh, mark dental advertising like in Australia? Is it taboo? Is it legal? Is it illegal? What, what are you guys doing? Does it work um, for Australia, your corporate? Australia has more restrictions than New Zealand. So New really? Zealand is, yeah, yeah, New Zealand is a pretty open market. Um, the, the only thing you can't say is that you, your dental council will, will provide guidelines on advertising. And you cannot say you're an expert in something. So um, you can't distinguish yourself as being better than anybody else. You can advertise your services, but you can't necessarily say you're an expert or a specialist. You know, so you can say you're a specialist if you're a registered specialist, prosthodontist, endodontist. You know, if you've got a a required qualification, absolutely. But a general dentist can't say I'm a specialist in tooth wear. You know, I can say, you know, I, I have a particular in clinical interest in tooth wear and erosion, you know, and I deal with a lot of people sort of in midlife with collapsing dentitions and I enjoy the the engineering and the artistry involved in restoring those mouths. So I, you know, I can say I have a, I have a, a particular interest in, a passion for, uh, things like that, but short, my choice of words um, has to be made fairly carefully in anything that I publish. So that, those are really the only restrictions. But I, you know, when Extreme Makeover was around in the '90s, you know, and and we had Bell on TV doing, you know, these amazing makeovers for people, I was the first person in New Zealand to run a TV uh, commercial, and it was just me sitting there saying, you know, everything that you see on Extreme Makeover, I can do. And it was a 15 second commercial that that ran throughout the entire course of um, the the program. And With Bill was, Dorfman. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, my, I dropped into the advertising spaces in the program, so it was running on prime time on our, our um, main TV channel in New Zealand at that time. And I thought, well, I'll make the most of this. I knew about Extreme Makeover, and before it was actually on air in, in New Zealand, I thought, let's make a commercial and run it in between in the ad breaks. So, um, so that was fun. That's that's very good. So, is, is your is your corporate dentistry chain that you work for, or that do they do a lot of advertising? Uh, they do some TV advertising. Yes, TV. they do. Now, see yeah, that that's then, another thing that a, that an individual dental office 
really doesn't have the scales of economy for. Mm. But if you had a group of north, south, east, west, and downtown in a city, now you're looking at radio and TV. But you, but you guys are doing TV. We are doing some TV, and and generally it's when there's a, there's a particular offer, you know. So, so for example, a financing offer, thirty months interest free, is a promotion that we're running at the moment with in conjunction with a product called Q Card, you know, which provides finance to patients. So, uh, you know, at other times we'll do you know a promotion which might be an examination at a fixed price or a half price new patient exam you know, a loss leader to, to bring new patients through the door. Um, but I also have a budget within my own um, my own practice to do some dedicated advertising. And some of that is around the fact that, you know, my, my particular expertise establishes a point of difference uh, in, in my community. And so I've got, you know, a, a budget of around about $30,000 to spend on advertising as I choose. You know, I have a standalone City Dental website and, uh, you know, Lumino City Dental website and uh, we do some discreet advertising. And what is your website? It's uh, citydental.co.nz. Citydental.co.nz. Nz. But if an American put citydental.com, what would happen? Would it go to your website? No, it wouldn't go to my website. So you got to go citydental.co.nz. Yes. That's my website. Um, and so, you know, you, you see some of the points of difference there. That one of the things that I'm working on at the moment is the concept of a risk assessment tool. Um, and we're, we're in the throes of building the app for that at the moment. It's called the Dental Fingerprint. And um, so I use that currently in a, a more rudimentary form, and you'll see some of that on my website. Um, and now, is the about- website Dental Fingerprint, or are you talking about Andrea, Andrea Shepherson? Com. No, on, on, on the City Dental website, you'll see that patients can come in for what we call the dental fingerprint examination. So it's a it's a risk assessment tool that I use in diagnosis to, as a patient communication tool, but also a checklist tool and organize, to organize thoughts. And so I'm working on uh, an app that dentists will be able to use themselves as a, as a diagnostic tool. Nice. When's that going to be done? Well, at this stage, uh, we probably won't be uh, have anything ready to release until about September. But you know, watch this space. I think it'll be a really you know, I, I, when I'm working a lot with dentists in education, I find that they they miss stuff, you know, and organising their thoughts and having a sequential uh, thought process. And some of this is derived from you know, because I'm a, a graduate and a mentor of the Koi Centre, so I'm a huge fan of John and. I, you does, know, that mean, taken, does that mean you use Windex on all your full mouth cases? Windex. Windex, he's Greek. Did you not watch the big fat Greek wedding? Remember that movie, I, the Greek, I, the big fat Greek wedding, the old Greek guy was using Windex on everything. Yeah. So, so I always tease John that his secret, since he's Greek, is that he uses Windex <laughs> on all of his, uh, on all of his, on all his grounds. Yeah. He's just, <laughs> he's just an amazing guy. And, you know, he John, is. um, you know, John has a wonderful system, which I use. I use his diagnostic opinion form in every new patient exam when I'm assessing a patient. But I found I needed something else that was a that was a different level of communication with the patients to send them away with something that was meaningful and, and put some relevance around, you know, why it was that they needed to come four times a year to see the hygienist and their husband needed to come twice. You know, what What are the differences in terms of risk assessment? And I think that this is probably one of the tools going forward that's going to help pay, distinguish patients who are embroiled in that um, insurance system, you know, that, that everybody actually is unique. And that's the message around the dental fingerprint, that as we start to get more data and we get more um, more ability to, to distinguish, um, you know, risk in individuals, uh, and you know the whole genomics project. You know, having a you know a chair side device that will you'll be able to spit on a, a lab chip and get some information about your particular risk of periodontal disease or oral cancer or diabetes, whatever it might be. That we're going to find that as these technologies emerge, having um, a customized profile for a patient, I think, is going to help to get better engagement. It doesn't. You know, it doesn't guarantee that the patient sees that they necessarily have a disability, 
And uh, the, the other person whose work I just adore and I've been using it and talking about it is Paul Homily. You know, and Paul talks about the fact that you, you know, if a patient doesn't recognise that they have a disability and they can't see a benefit, then, you know, and they can't make it fit, then it ain't going to happen. So one of the things in my teaching that I spend a lot of time on is not just the whole the clinical diagnostic being the dental detective thing, but also how you interact and the human interaction that you have with, with the patient. So I, I've spent um, many years with Omar Reid, who's a really good friend of mine, and, you know, done a lot of reading about relationship-based dentistry. And that that is just a huge part going forward of my message to young dentists who tend to communicate by emoji, you know, and communicating by emoji is not enough. You've got to you've got to have a better relationship with your patients and have better soft skills to be successful, I think, in this tech space. So tech alone is not going to be enough. You've still got to be a human being and be able to interact with patients on that level. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, I think you just like people from Phoenix. Paul Homily lives in Phoenix. I <laughs> live in Phoenix. And Omar Reed lives in Phoenix. <laughs> So you just so you're uh, you're talking to me and you're and two of your th- the only guy that should that live in Phoenix that you just mentioned was Koi up in Seattle. Yeah. So you you should come down to Phoenix and uh, have dinner with uh, me, Omar Reed, and Paul Homily. That would be a great dinner. Oh, wouldn't that be awesome? Actually, I'm going to be in Phoenix shortly because I'm doing the I'm doing the river trip for the fifth time, not the- with Omar, but um, the Colorado River. So we are, we started I started out rafting the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon in 1990 with Omar and Marcy. And then um, I did that, that trip several times with them. And then my husband said for his 50th birthday, he wanted to do a trip. So we, we had taken the kids and my husband on the trip uh, with Omar and Marcy. And then when he turned 50, he said, no, I want to do my own trip. And I'm going to get all my friends from around the world. He, my husband's actually South African. So he's got he's got mates from all over who are based in the U.S. And, um, and so we took a, a bunch of families. We had 24 people, and we did this incredible trip down the river with our, with our friends. So we're actually going back in July this year to do a 10-day trip this time uh, with a group of friends, once again, from U.S., South Africa, New Zealand families. The kids are bringing friends. So I'll be, I'll be in Phoenix in July, and then I'm going up to the Koi Center Symposium at the end of July after that. I wish you'd do me a favor. So... So we got we got that dental time. So there's 212,000 dentists on the website. Like I say, 83% US. Um, we got 50,000 on the smartphone. You know what my number one complaint about my podcast and online CE is and articles in Dental Mag- Talent Magazine? You know what my complaint number one complaint is? What is it? That all the dentists that write them in are male. And what they don't realize is that half the dental school graduates are female. But when you start going to dentists my age... Well, they're, they're mostly male and, and I'm always on the hunt. I always, I'm always on the hunt for a woman dentist who will write me an article, do a podcast, do a clinical CE course. Cause they, there's 5,000 dental graduates a year, 2,500 of them are women. And they send me emails that, uh, you know, that there should be, it should be women, half women dentists. And so I'm always begging you if, if, if women dentists make me an online CE course, do a podcast with me, write me an article. Because it is our number one complaint. It's something we at we at every editorial meeting, and I, I call I call women dentists that do clinical cases unicorns. I said because <laughs> you'll you'll find ten unicorns for every woman dentist that'll do you online. So I I would I would love for you to do clinic and clinical is uh, the most popular uh, online CE subject on uh, Dental Town. Okay, so it's, what, it's a, what aspect of clinical are you, are you thinking? What, what whatever you're passionate about. Okay, I love occlusion. I love toothwear. I love erosion. I, you know, digital. I, I can, yeah, I can do something. For well, you. I, I think, I think. Uh, well, I'll, 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 I'll go through those. What you said. Um, I think occlusion is the most um, stressful when, when we're talking about just dentists under thirty, which is a big. Most of the American podcast audience is under thirty. So, mm-hmm. like all my friends that I went to school with, uh, I don't even think they know what a podcast is. And when I'm with them. They can't even find it on a on an iPhone, so they don't even know what it is. But under thirty, most of the emails I get on this show are under thirty, and they they, they here's the first question they come out with. They say, "Okay, I got three hundred fifty thousand dollars of student loans, and um, I want to learn more about occlusion, but you know these camps are all expensive. I mean, Coys, Scottsdale, LVI, they're all, they're all big money, but some of them market as neuromuscular, and some of them uh, market as uh, CR, you know, whatever." 
So that's a big question they have for him. You know, what what is the difference? Because they don't they don't want to go they don't want to go to two camps and pay him each five grand. You know what I mean? So that that's the point. You know, I think occlusion is always um, TMJ is always uh, stressful for them. Um, full anything full mouth. Of course, you know the all the dental school in the first ten years out, you're mostly doing single crown dentistry. Of course you are. Yeah. So it's a big jump to go from a single crown to a quadrant let alone an arch or a full mouth. So any of that stuff. And uh, I would love, uh, I know you're a rock star in New Zealand. I'd love to make you a rock star in America with these people. And um, by the way, what is the, is the changing dentist male to female, the same phenomena yes. in the United States as Australia? New exactly, Zealand? exactly the same, exactly the same. So we, I think we're, we've got around about 60% of graduating students at the moment are women. Um, well, I spoke to some dental students uh, recently, actually, I went down to the university and did a presentation to them on, on their future, basically, in dentistry, and they were quite blown away. Um, and so, you know, half the room definitely would have been women, for sure. And we're seeing that um, as we're recruiting too, you know, in our, in our industry for our corporate, 50% would be women, definitely. Um, across the group as a whole, we've still got a lot of, you know, the older dentists who are, um, who are definitely, you know, dominated by men. So when I graduated, about 12% were women. But I would love to do something. And I find that, I find that young dentists are really, I, I talk to them a lot about, and, you know, engaging their brain. So not actually losing, not, not just going, let's go to YouTube and learn how to do something. Let's, let's you know, go to Dr. Google and look something up. Um, and some of them are very reluctant to spend on continuing education. And I understand that because they've got, you know, limited discretionary income, particularly if they're servicing student loans. But at some point, making that leap to spend on some quality education is fantastic, you know. And I, I did that years ago as a young dentist. I, you know, I've been to IDEA. I actually did one program at the LVI. I, you know, did their occlusion program initially. And then I found the Coy Centre and I, you know, been to Pascal and Michel Manier's veneer program and an idea with Bob Lamb. And, you know, so you, you want to invest in quality education at some point in your career. I understand the decision about where to go and what to do is really, really challenging. I'm terribly grateful I chose COIS, the COIS Centre, because it's been amazing uh, and, and really helped put me in the position that I'm in to manage very complex cases at this stage of my career. But when I talk to young dentists, I really want to get across that that um, idea that you shouldn't you, know, you shouldn't stop using your brain and thinking about stuff and they'll come to me and they'll say um, I, I've got the cement in the office or I want to get a, a new cement uh, which one should I get and I go well it depends what you're cementing you know Depends whether you're doing all ceramic. Are you putting on a veneer? Are you putting on a PFM? You know what? And and you know what's your clinical situation? Are you bonding to enamel? You know, are you using a self-adhesive cement to try and bond an onlay and wondering, you know, why later on it might debond? And so if you if you haven't etched some enamel, and so even the basic biomaterials understanding I find is actually lacking. And there's a tendency when you come out of practice, you go into a practice, and that, that's quite formative, the practice that you choose. So I say choose that practice really carefully because you can develop some really bad habits and lose that ability to think and be dropped into an environment where nobody's willing to support you with education or quality materials and you're, you know, you're just churning out dentistry. You're a machine to support the senior dentist. Um, and, and, you know, find a practice that really is going to support you on many levels and, and keep using that brain, keep inquiring, keep asking why, 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 why do I do this? Why am I making this choice? You know, what's different about this patient? Why should I do it this way? Get some good science around those decisions as well as, you know, understanding the, the human element. And that's the uh, the biggest predictor of some young kid's success, even when they're 10 or 15 years, is their, their level of natural curiosity. Yeah. The kid that just keeps wanting to know why and why and why and why and why. They always end up on the top of the mountain. And the, and the kid that doesn't care or ask. By the way, I do all my cementations with uh, wood glue uh, when I'm working on Pinocchio. But only <laughs> only when I'm working on Pinocchio. How bad was that joke, Ryan? Is that are you gonna edit that one out? Uh, one cement for all, Howard. <laughs> well, when you're working on Pinocchio, that's what works. But hey, um, I um I really uh thank you so much for spending. So it's uh it's two thirty here, so that means what it's nine thirty in the morning in Auckland? 
Yes, I'm about to head off to the office to do and some you're, And you're already, um, you're already ahead of me by a day. You're already in Tomorrowland. No wonder you know so much more than me. Uh, you're, you're living, you're living in the future. I would love to get an online C course out of you. I, I just, they, they love it. They demand it. They get so mad when every time they see a course or an article it's written by some older fat bald guy, uh, you know, they're just, you know, so, uh, it would be so amazing for you to be a role model, uh, for so many, uh, younger women, Dennis in America, but you know, and, 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 and you know why, you know why I like women dentists so much more than male dentists? is because when you go into countries, like say you go to the United States, you go into teaching, okay, public schools, there's no money in public schools, and it's all women. And when I go around the world, wherever there's a lot of money in dentistry, uh, it was male-dominated, you know? And then you go to countries where there has never been any money in dentistry, and it's all females. The women always show up to do what's right, do the right thing, even when there's no money involved. That, that's why I just totally respect women dentists around the world more uh, than male dentists because uh, male dentists so oftentimes they want to go in the richest part of town and treat lifestyles of the rich and famous and all that. And it's the women who will go to the middle class and the poor, and they'll even do it for no money. They're just saints. But uh, thank you so much for spending an hour with me, and I hope I get to see you when you're in Phoenix or the next time I'm in Auckland. Absolutely, Howard. I'll I'll get in touch. I think that dinner is definitely on the cards. That would be okay. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll light up Omer and Marcy and uh, and Paul Homily and his uh, his significant other and all that, and we'll do it. Fantastic. Look forward to it. And then and then we'll all raft down the Colorado River and see how many are left at the end of the trip. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, we have to take John Coyce down the Colorado too. I think that would be a blast. That would be the ultimate. Okay, great seeing you. Thanks.